I'm looking forward as the years go on to being able to tell people my junior that I was the last generation that was born before the advent of the internet. And I remember, as you do as well, going to do research at a library. And you'd physically have to go to another place, and then you'd have to know about the structure of the library and the nonfiction section and how the number system classification worked, and you'd have to know how to find things. But if you didn't, that's okay, because there were these amazing people who were the font of all knowledge called librarians. And you could just go to them and you could say, I'm trying to find out about this. And it doesn't matter what this was, they would know where to send you. Now the librarian is Google. And it is a pathway to a lot of great insight and information. I haven't gone to a library to do research in a few years. Not all the time is the information that is available super reliable, but it is super convenient. And so I used to enjoy saying round about the time in which a lot of people were coming to be more familiar with gaining information, gathering information on the internet. I used to be fond of saying, the internet will solve all your problems, hyperbole. But it sure was this wonderful wide opening up, the democratization in many ways of information that now is mostly taken for granted. And I frame the beginning of this sermon that way in order to hearken back to a time way before you'd go to a librarian and ask to be pointed to a physical book, but back to a time in which in your dwelling place, more likely to be a smaller village than a big city, your access to wisdom and insight was limited to the people that you knew. You didn't have access to books. So the answers to questions or the transmittal of wisdom happened orally. You'd go to an elder where you lived or perhaps to the source of the collection of stories, the shaman. And the shaman would tell stories that would become frames for life's larger meaning. So in this gospel passage this morning, we hear this overlap of that kind of ancient transmittal of wisdom happening through verbal exchange and a very, very early precursor to the age of Google it. And here's what I mean. This person comes to Jesus and asks him a story. And unfortunately, in the Gospel of Matthew, it's, it's a disingenuous question. We are alerted when the Gospel says a lawyer came to ask Jesus a question and test him. In another Gospel, it's a sincere question. But in this one, we have to grapple with the reality that the person was playing gotcha, not playing enlighten me. But nevertheless, we can use the question for enlighten me. And he says, what is the greatest law in all of the Jewish law? Which commandment in the law is the greatest? And I say that it's a precursor to the age of Google it because the law is vast. And in order to gain the richness of the wisdom of the Jewish law, you have to invest some time. But not everybody has the time or is interested in investing the time. And so it's more reminiscent of right now when we say, can you tell it to me in 30 seconds or less? And sometimes the answer is, yeah, I can do that. And other times the answer should be, no, this is just not a question that we can take on right now. Complexity requires us to go a little bit deeper than a 30 second answer. But Jesus indulges the questioner. Jesus understands the setup. And he says, all right, I'll play along with you even though you are not sincere. 
And the answer that he gives is the summation of all of the law, the richness and the depth of it, over 600 separate instances of Jewish legal teaching, if you go into the Torah and you start counting them, is love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That really, even though this is an ancient story, hits at a modern sensibility. Can you just make it quick for me? Can you just give me the summary version so I can get on with my day? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he thinks, hmm, all right, let's have a little fun with these guys. I got a question for you. And he comes back at them with this question that kind of makes our brain hurt a little bit about whose son calls who Lord and whose father is whose son. And you know, you start thinking about that song about can I be my grandpa's whatever. And what he's doing is he's saying to them, you know, you just heard something profound but you didn't even recognize it. And now I'm giving you something like for like, and you don't get it. We have always throughout human history, whether it's going to the shaman, whether it's going to the librarian, whether it's going to Google, we have always grasped in part what it is that we receive. And to those who are able, to those who are willing to invest more time in the contemplation, in the reflection, there is more to be gained. Sometimes you just need to know a fact quickly, but in the things that Jesus has to say, these are things that require at least a few moments of reflection, better a lifetime of reflection and internalization. And so one of the dilemmas of things that are pithy, of slogans that can fit on a bumper sticker is that they become kind of forgettable, or at least we become immune to their potency. It is so succinct that the profundity of it escapes us. And in times in which individuals would invest a longer amount of time to really, in the words of a colic prayer that we had a few weeks ago, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest some material. When we don't take that time, there are things that fly by us, just as they did the lawyer who was questioning Jesus and the rest of his audience. You and I have heard, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We've heard that a bunch of times. So many times that it's either gotten deep within us or now it just kind of flies right by us and we don't even register it. And maybe sometimes both. But today is the day in which we're reminded that there are some sources of wisdom wherever they may come from, the shaman, the librarian, or Google, that are worth dwelling deeply in, that are worth pausing, putting the other things on hold for a little while, and reflecting, how do I do that? And how can I do that? And when do I do that? And what are the challenges of doing that? And when do I get distracted from doing that? And you can go on and on and on. The questions oftentimes wonderfully yield more fruit the further we go with them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the literalists among them, and I plead guilty to that, go, I, I can't do it with all. That's an impossible task from the beginning. And those of you who are better 
acquainted with nuance and subtlety and degrees of wisdom go, yeah, right, that's okay. How can I best do that now? And later on this afternoon, how can I best do that? And when I wake up tomorrow morning, what's the best that I can do with that? And as I go through this coming week and other things come to me and occupy my mind and my attention and the reading of the gospel on Sunday fades further and further into my past, how do I hold on to that and keep doing it? We live in this wonderful time in which we have access to so much. The ancients, our ancestors, would be jealous to the extreme at how quickly and conveniently we can tap into all kinds of different sources of wisdom that they would have either never had access to or it would have taken a tremendous effort. And now we can click, click, and it's there. But sometimes that works against us because when we click, click, and we go down the rabbit hole and somebody says to us, what did you just read 10 minutes ago? We go, I don't know. That was 10 minutes ago, that was an age ago, I don't have any idea. And so we have to make in this present time in which our shaman and our librarian is Google, we have to make more of an effort to choose the particular things that we're going to put in those places of permanence that continue to be present and accessible to us day in and day out. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. Wouldn't it be an interesting lens to go through this coming week and as you make all the choices that you are going to make, the things that lie before you, the things both that you know about and the things that are gonna to come to you unexpected, if you asked yourself, in this present moment, how do I love God right now? I'm gonna go get my oil changed. How am I gonna love God as I do that? I gotta talk with a friend who I haven't spoken with in a long time. How do I love God and how will God be present in that conversation? When it, the elections come in short order, how do I love God? with all my heart, soul, and mind as I discern who my vote is going to go for. Because if it's true, as Christianity proclaims, that God is all in all, then there's no venue, there's no encounter, there's no occupation that we have that we can't be mindful that God is present and that our love for God can also be present. This is deep wisdom and it's worth holding on to. And in a way, the Gospel of Matthew's portrayal of this encounter is perhaps more instructive for us in its disingenuity. The fact that the person wasn't sincerely seeking the wisdom that Jesus had to offer is a reminder to us that we too are susceptible to sometimes going through life only half present with our attention already moving on towards the thing that's coming next or stuck in regret or an endless loop of going over something that happened before and the present isn't fully present to us. But when Jesus honors the questioner, even though his motive is not sincere, we are reminded that God does the same thing with us that even when we're not able to be fully present, God still says, I'm here with you, and I love you. And when you're able, I would love to be loved by you. And so this is our opportunity. Some people use the word mindfulness to talk about this phenomenon of truly being present in the moment to what it is that occupies your attention. It's a valuable practice. And it is not new age, even though some people have only discovered it recently. It is ancient. It's something that the shamans knew and taught. It's something that the librarians offered when they had somebody in front of them who was willing to give them their full attention. And it is something that we remain capable of 
when we decide to do so. So Jesus offers us deep wisdom, not many words, but profound. Love God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments are enough to occupy us for this entire week to come and throughout the rest of our lives. Amen.